Well, welcome to Grace this weekend. My name's Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And if uh, maybe you're a guest with us, we probably haven't met yet. I would love to meet you. And uh, we've been in a series, as Pastor Nate just mentioned, called Right Now for just the last handful of weeks. And here's what we've really been saying. We said everybody's in uh, kind of a season of life or a situation that doesn't really matter where I am, if I'm married or single or rich or poor, if I'm in school or I'm finding my first job or if I'm facing retirement, I'm always kind of facing my new season of life for the first time. And we said that right now, wherever that season is, is going to create some unique challenges, unique opportunities. And uh, we said it also comes with some temptations. As we've been talking about this, we kicked the series off. We said there's really kind of three major myths that I can believe. There's probably more than that, but we talked about three. That when I'm in a season of life, I'm tempted to believe a handful of different things. When I'm in my season, I might look out in the future and say, man, you know what? Life really isn't happening right now. It's out there in the future. You know, when, when fill in the blank happens, that's when life is really going to start. When I finish high school, when I graduate, when the loan goes through, if she says yes or he pops the question, or man, we have our first kid, right? There, there's an arrival myth that we talked about. And we said life is out there somewhere, and when that happens, then I'm really going to start living. So that's one of the things that we can believe. It's kind of out there in the future. We said, if I look at the rival myth, I also might look at the nostalgia myth. I might look backwards and look in the past. And we said, there might be a high water mark back here in my life when things were really amazing. When I was dating that girl or that guy, back when we were in college, it was so much fun. And we'll look back at a time that life was really popping. And we'll say, man, if we could get back there, and not just looking back in kind of a, a reflective, fun way, but really believing that life has kind of passed me by and I'm always chasing something that's already gone by me. Right? So we look forward in the future, the arrival myth. We look back in the past, the nostalgia myth. And we also talked about the filtered life myth, where uh, in, in our world, social media has just created kind of an exponential increase in amount of times I'm going to see other people's lives. They're perfected filtered, cropped life, pictures of people smiling on the beach, and I'm going to look around at other people's filtered life and think, and if my life was like theirs, then I would really be living. It would be amazing then. Right? And we said the problem with all of those myths is that if I believe any one of those, future, past, or kind of looking around at the people around me, I'm going to miss the wonder of what's happening in my life right now. And we said, we kind of asked this question, we said, what if it's possible that where I am that I'm there on purpose, that there's actually a reason that I'm there, and that actually God wants to do some things in me, and He wants to do some things through me. What if I'm where I am on purpose? Kind of ask that question. And we began to kind of go down this road on a journey, asking that question, kind of looking for the answer to those. And so we've been taking a look at different life stages, life situations, and uh, over the last handful of weeks, we looked at kind of a life through the mom lens, through parenting lens. And then uh, last week, we talked about midlife investment. We said if we're at the peak of our influence, and that's our right now, how do we kind of wrestle with that and maximize that? And what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to dive into a conversation on singleness and dating. Singleness and dating. And I realize that as we jump into that, even as I say that, there's all kinds of forms and faces that singleness can take. You know, you might be in, in high school or college and saying, I, I'm just kind of entering into this, the dating scene, trying to figure this whole thing out. Uh, you might be single and content, saying, you know, I'm really not even interested in dating right now. That's not even really on the radar for me. Uh, you, you might be single and you actually were married before. And for whatever reason, it might be a complicated story, but maybe your marriage has ended and now you're finding yourself single again. Um, maybe you're longing to be married, right? You're single and you, you wish you could find the right person, that God would bring the right person to your life and that you could kind of make that connection and get married. Uh, some of us might be in here and we're single and we might even uh, kind of struggle or wrestle with same-sex attraction, Maybe you're a Christ follower and you want to be obedient and you know that it's wrong to act on that temptation, but you wrestle with it and you don't know who to talk to about it, even in the church, and you wonder, how am I going to live my life? What do I do now? So singleness can show up in all kinds of ways. Maybe you even lost someone. You lost your spouse and you're a widow. 
And the Bible actually has very specific things to say to widows that we can't get into all of that today. But there, there's a whole myriad of different ways that singleness can show up. It's complicated. Uh, but we want to take, a, take some time to look at it. And here's what I would say. If you are a married person today, do not check out of this conversation. It's super important. Here's why. You, I almost guarantee, you know somebody, a family member, a friend, someone in your life is single. Maybe it's your adult children, maybe it's your parents, right? maybe it's a friend, but single people are around you all the time. And I got to tell you guys, I'm, I've been married for 15 years, so I had to look around at my single friends and I said, hey, you guys got to help me out here. I'm not really sure what it's like to be single. I kind of have forgotten. Will you help give me some perspective? And I got to tell you, listen, married folks, I learned an absolute ton talking to my friends about this. They taught me a ton. One of the things I asked them to do is I said, hey, would you write down uh, some, some things that maybe people have said to you that have been hurtful, uh, maybe some things that we shouldn't say if we're married people when we're talking to single people? And so they jotted down this little list for me. I thought I'd share it with you. Here's some of what they said. I said, here's what not to say if we're married talking to single people. Just wait. The right person's out there. You just have to be patient. Okay, kind of wait it out. When you become content with where you are, God will bring the right one along. It'll just happen. Right? It's kind of the Disney promise. Right? If you wish upon a star, it'll just happen. Magic. Right? People will just come in. Like, here's, here's a good one. Maybe you haven't found someone because you're too picky. Right? You got to just put yourself out there. Lower your standards. Great job, married folks. <laughs> right? Very encouraging marital advice you got there. Here's a great one. I love this. You must have so much free time. What do you do with all your spare time? Right? Single people, you're just bored, just hanging out. I know that, right? right? And that's fantastic. Here's a good one. You just think you're tired, but just wait until you have kids, then you'll really know what tired is. I added the finger part, right? That's kind of how I imagine they said it. Here's a good one. Being single, man, that must be so nice. Do you realize what you just said about your marriage? Right? If, you, if you look at a single person and say, I wish I wasn't married. That must be awesome. Here's a good one. Don't worry. You're a great catch. You'll find someone. There are plenty of fish in the sea. Can we just ban that statement? Can we just like never say that again? Here, you should try a dating website. Here's a good one. You should start serving more and then you'll find someone. You should offer to babysit so couples can have a date night. It's <laughs> great. This might be my favorite ever. You mean there aren't any single guys or girls at your church? Maybe you should go to another church with more single guys and girls. Some of you guys are like, that's actually not a bad idea. <laughs> I'm out of here. And this, is, uh, this is fun. You are so great. I can't believe you haven't found someone yet. I literally said this to this person. As I read this, I was like, I made the list. I'm like, no, how did I do that? Right? Here's a good one. Don't you want kids? The clock is ticking. Ouch. Right? If we're listening to this list, we, we probably said something like that. And maybe you have, if you're married, you haven't even thought about what it's like to be single in a while. I know I haven't spent a ton of time thinking that way. And how does this happen? I think for, for probably really good reasons, our culture and probably even more so our church culture has elevated marriage. Right? For, for, again, for all kinds of good reasons. Marriage is important to society. It's an important piece of what makes society work. And so in light of that, we, we kind of elevate marriage to this high level. And I just want us to recognize that when we do that, sometimes what can happen is if single people, as they hear that, they can start to feel devalued and start to even feel like a, a second, kind of a second class citizen, so to say, or like they're incomplete. And what we want to make sure we're careful of is that we're not communicating something that just isn't true, right? Because God... Here's the thing. God did not promise. If you're single, I cannot guarantee you that God is going to bring someone into your life. I do not have a crystal ball, and neither do any of your married friends. We can't look and say, oh, yeah, God's going to bring somebody in your life. It's going to be magical. It's going to be awesome. Like every Disney movie come to life. I can't look at you and say that. I don't know the answer to that question. I know all kinds of other answers about who God is, and I can tell you those truths. But I can't guarantee you that God's going to answer that specific prayer in your life. 
So we want to make sure that we are thinking about this the right way. And I would say it's just as important for married people to think and to know and to hear about singleness as it is for single people to learn and to think and to hear about marriage. We want to understand each other and be able to help and serve and be supportive to each other. So we're going to talk through a handful of principles here over our time, and then we're going to grab hold at the end kind of to one overarching principle that I promise is going to be applicable to everybody in the room. Sound good? We're talking about singleness and dating, and we're going to dive into a passage here that the Apostle Paul really gives some insight into. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you have a Bible, you can open up there. And if you don't have a Bible, not a big deal at all. Grab one from underneath the chairs. You can open up uh, your app as well. And it's page 796 in those Bibles under the chairs. 1 Corinthians, here's what the Apostle Paul is doing even before we look at our verses today. I would just make a note if you're taking notes to go back and read this whole chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, kind of no matter where you are in the map. He's going to talk to people who are married, people who are single, people who are considering divorce, people who are widowed. He talks kind of to everybody, and we're only going to have time to look at a handful of these passages, but a great section of Scripture, and uh, Paul gives some great insight here. So here's what he says, in, starting in verse 32 of chapter 7. He says, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Here's what Paul is saying. Paul is a single guy. He's a leader in the early church, and he himself knows kind of how this works. And he, what he's going to do is he's going to look at kind of men and women, and he's going to say, listen, if, if it's your goal to please God, if you're a guy and it's your goal to please God, if you're a lady and it's your goal to please God, let me talk to you a little bit about how singleness actually has a lot of value to it. And and what's interesting is he kind of elevates singleness in this conversation. He's going to say the marriage relationship is going to take a certain amount of devotion or attention. Marriage relationship is unique, right? We vow to each other when we are married to take care of each other, to know each other, live life together. And what that does is that takes a certain amount of time and energy and mental focus and commitment in my life to make that marriage work. What Paul's going to say is all of that energy and attention and focus and time that it takes to make a marriage work does not show up when I'm single and I can invest that energy differently. I can actually devote that to following Christ with. So he's going to talk about marriage and say, hey, if your goal is to please Jesus, I want you to know singleness is not a bad option. It's not a bad way to go. Now, what's interesting is if we went through the rest of the New Testament or the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and we looked at marriage, we would look and we would start to hear Paul talk about marriage and say, hey, listen, if you want to be a reflection of Christ in the church, if you want to glorify God, you could get married. And so on one hand, you say, geez, it seems like Paul really likes singleness in this passage. If you go to another one, it seems like he really likes marriage. What's going on here? And here's what Paul might say if we could boil it down, put it in your notes this way. Being single and being married have equal value in the eyes of God. Being single and being married have equal value in the eyes of God. Here's what we mean by that. There are different ways to approach the same thing. The goal, whether I'm single, whether I'm married, is to please God. And I can do it differently through these two different avenues. Both have limitations, both have advantages, but they're two completely legitimate ways to do that. So it's not that single people and being in a stage or right now of singleness is like a holding tank until I get to the real thing, which is marriage. Not that at all. Singleness is is a completely legitimate way to operate and to follow Christ. That is huge to know because sometimes inadvertently we will believe that that singleness is not quite there yet. 
and that it's not quite the way to follow Jesus. And if I really wanted to be spiritually mature, I would get married. Okay, they have equal value, equal value. And actually, Paul would go so far as, as to say this, singleness can actually open up some possibilities that are not available in marriage. Right? Singleness can open up possibilities that are not available in marriage. Because I have this resource, this amount of time and energy and focus that's not available in marriage. It's not that there's not other commitments. We all have uh, people in our lives that we're connected to, we're going to give ourselves to. Paul's going to say, I can take that energy though, however, that would be devoted to marriage and knowing someone in marriage, and I can invest that differently in a relationship with Christ. So, for example, if I say it's my goal to please God and I'm single, I can look and say, man, I have, I have some freedom, some space to go chase down understanding how God has gifted me. You know, every spiritual person, every follower of Jesus has spiritual gifts. I want to understand what those are, discover those, and say, hey, how can I develop this? And there might be passions that God has put into you. If you're a single person today, there may be things that you say, man, if I, could, if I could do anything for God and not fail, I would do this. Well, you actually have the ability to chase that down in, in somewhat of a unique way that a married person can't quite chase that down. I know uh, when Lori and I were first dating, uh, what was in her heart and her passion to do is she wanted to go be on Broadway. And, uh, you know, she, she was, her eyes were set on that. She's really good at musical theater. And she was kind of on a track to get there, you know. And then, and then here comes me into her life. And I was like, hey, I can wreck your dreams. It's going to be awesome, <laughs> you know. And then I, I came into her life. And, and for Lori, she, there's a very real sense that this is true. She really, at the end of the day, had to pick, you know, as we started to date, which place am I going to land here? I, I feel like I want to give my life to, to Broadway and to performing and use that as a ministry to impact people. And now here's this guy that's come along, and here's the reality. This guy's called the ministry. That's going to change the trajectory of my dreams. You know, so now, now she can do some community theater sometimes. It's just not quite the same. There's a reality that that dream in some ways is done, and now she's trading that in for a different one. When I'm single, I can chase that all the way through. There's a reality to that. Right? There's a possibility there. Not to say that there's not pain, but we want to elevate the fact that those possibilities are real. You need to move. You might be able to move. You might be able to change geography. Maybe you want to go to the mission field. Maybe you dreamed of going back to... Who knows what it is? There's a possibility to move in a way that married people sometimes just can't. Right? because we've made a commitment, and that's limit the set of possibilities that are open and available to us. Okay. Let's say I'm single, and I, I want to start to look at the dating relationship, right? I, I want to start to consider dating. Uh, what, what is that going to look like, and what might be some principles that I would gain from dating, right? I know that being married and being single have equal value in the eyes of God. One is not better or higher than the other. I know that uh, singleness can open up possibilities that marriage cannot. Now what? Paul would continue to kind of drill down into this conversation. Verse 36, right in the same uh, chapter, he says this, if anyone is worried that he might be acting, uh, not be acting honorably toward the virgin he's engaged to, if his passions are too strong and if he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He's not sinning. They should get married. He said, the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion, but has control over his own, own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then, he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does better. And, and here's what is going on. i got to give you a little context here. So when we think of dating, our definition of dating, where you would uh, kind of date to date, uh, it is a completely foreign concept to the scriptures. Right? So you're not even going to see that word show up in the Bible. So yeah, what are some principles that, about dating? Really, there, there kind of aren't any. We can gain some insight because here's how dating worked in the Bible. If you're going to move into a romantic relationship with someone, it's always for the hope and the purpose of marriage. 
It's always for the hope and the purpose of marriage. And so here, here's what he's saying. He's saying, if you're going to date, uh, make marriage the end goal. Right? If you're going to date, make marriage the end goal. So let's talk about this a little bit. He speaks first to people that are kind of dating or engaged is the word that he would use uh, to say you're, you're in this relationship and things are heating up romantically. You have a decision to make about what to do with that relationship. And here's how I was taught. This was so helpful for me. And when I first came to know Christ in college, I started to learn a little bit about dating and marriage. And Lori and I were friends. We started dating each other. And I wanted to learn all I could about how this all works. And I, I remember hearing this teaching. They said, here's how this ideally should work. Ideally, people who are followers of Jesus get to know each other, right? And maybe in a church setting or a group setting, they become friends. And they start to share with each other what they're learning in their faith. And, and they build kind of a spiritual friendship. And think of that as, as three wells. There's a first well is kind of the spiritual well. And say, as that fills up, as we get to know each other and build a friendship based on our faith, ideally, that well would fill up and it would pour over into a, the, another well, a next well, where now it's an emotional well. And that starts to fill up and we start to become fond of one another. We start to like each other. Say, hey, you're kind of cute. Let's talk, right? It starts to fill up. We become not just friends. We start to have kind of a rom romantic connection and say, hey, I, I would like to talk more about this beyond just hanging out as members of a church. As that emotional well fills up, naturally what will happen is that will spill over into a physical well. And as that physical well starts to move where you want to be intimate with one another, that's a natural set of desires. But listen, it's very, very dangerous. It's a very, very dangerous thing. So as that physical well starts to fill up, here's what Paul would say. If you feel like you're not acting, acting honorably towards this virgin that you're engaged to, you got to get married. You got to start thinking about marriage. If you're dating or if you're engaged and you've got somebody that you're connected to and things are heating up physically, here's what I would encourage you to kind of push that relationship to a, to a breaking point where that relationship's either going to go one of two ways. We're either going to break up or we're going to get married. Right? If we're getting serious, if we're talking about living together or if we're already living together, if things are getting physical, we got to decide, hey, do we just mess this up and we need to break up? Can we just be honest about that? Or do we need to start talking about marriage? Why? Because the, the end goal of dating is marriage. I'll tell you, it, if you engage in the hookup culture, right, where we're just having sex to have sex, and we're just connecting with people to connect, and it's fun, it's, it's, right, it's kind of an entertainment thing, here's what I can promise you. You will introduce more pain into your life than you can possibly imagine. For me, right, personally, before I came to know Jesus, I would have engaged our culture that way, and I can tell you, the decisions that I regret the most have to do with this arena of life. Improperly handling romantic relationships and improperly handling my own purity. Oh, it's the stuff I regret the most. I wish I could go back and do differently. I know I'm forgiven. But just hear me. If you're in the middle of this or you're dating or you're living together, we got to bring that thing to a head and get some clarity about it. And we would love to help you do that. Okay. Love to help you get clear about how to move from here. But don't stay in a place where impurity is happening. All right, if you're going to date, make marriage the end goal. I want to date in the context of knowing that I want to move towards marriage. If I'm not in the place where I can pursue a marriage, if I'm in high school and I know I'm not getting married anytime soon, I've got to start to think, why am I doing this? Right? What, what, how much energy am I going to invest in this, and how far can this really go? All right, let me show you another passage. First principle, we lay out, if you're going to date, make marriage the end goal. Here's another one. Shows up in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul is going to say this, very simple statement, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. And here's what Paul means by that. He's saying if you're a Christ follower and you're looking to, to join into a marriage relationship or you're looking to get serious with someone, you want to join yourself or yoke yourself to someone who's also a Christ follower. 
I, I want to join with someone who believes what I believe. And I'll tell you, this just makes sense. As somebody who didn't follow Jesus for the first half of their life, I did not approach life like a Christ follower did. A Christ follower is going to look and say, hey, I, I make decisions and I value things based on the Bible. God is my authority and I want to follow God and I'm going to listen to whatever the Bible says. For me, as a person who wasn't yet a Christ follower, I realized that's where some of us are. And by the way, if you're here and you're not yet following Christ, thanks so much for being here. Kind of invest in your morning with us. There's a million places you could be. But I realized that you, like I was, I, I made decisions based on whatever I wanted to do, whatever I thought was right. right. And that could be all over the board. Sometimes there could be some overlap with the Bible, but often there wouldn't. Here's how I describe it to couples who uh, are engaged or dating, and one person's a Christ follower and one is not. Here's kind of the, the picture I have in my mind. I said, it's kind of like you're in a car together and you're going on a trip and one of you wants to go to California and one of you wants to go to Florida. What does that do? It creates a constant tension of where are we going? What values, what priorities, how we're going to spend our money, how we're going to spend our time. I'm saying, listen, if you you get married, you're going to introduce that into your relationship forever. It's going to cause you some misery because you're always aiming at different things. Okay. So, so here's, here's kind of the principle. If you're going to date someone, right, if you're going to date someone, filter by who they follow. Filter by who they follow. If you're going to ask somebody out or somebody's going to ask you out, filter that invitation by who they follow. Do they follow themselves? Do they follow Jesus? What do they believe? And I want to filter that decision based on what that person believes. By the way, even if you're not a Christ follower, that's good advice. Right? If, you're, if you're already engaged and you're going to get married and, and you're right there and you're not yet following Jesus, it's probably not a bad I- idea just to, to make sure that you guys believe the same thing, so that there's alignment in your values and in your beliefs. If you're going to date someone, filter by who they follow. Okay. If I'm single, right, I'm equal with somebody who's married. There's opportunities that are open to me. If I'm going to date I want to make sure I make marriage the end goal. If I'm going to say yes to someone, I want to filter it by who they follow. Dating can be going great for us. We may be out and saying, I'm not dating at all. What is maybe an overarching principle that we could all walk away with in regards to singleness, dating, and probably applicable to all of life? I want to show you this. Paul's going to talk to this in the book of Colossians. Great principle that he sets in front of us. Put it here on the screen. You don't even have to turn there. Here's what he says. He says, set your hearts on the things above where Christ is. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Set your hearts on things above, not on earthly things. So Paul's going to look and say, I- I'm going to make a decision on where I set my heart, on where my focus is. And, and here's why. Because the reality is this. Whatever I set my focus on, whatever I stare at, is going to grow. Let me show you what I mean. Whatever I stare at is going to grow. So I got all kinds of different places I might be in life, different right nows. Maybe I'm single, that's what we're talking about today. And if I set my mind, if I stare at my singleness, what's going to happen is that's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger in my life. I'm going to feel more and more lonely, and I'm going to wonder more and more, is God ever going to bring somebody into my life? And all of a sudden, singleness becomes the definer of who I am. It becomes the totality of my vision. It consumes me because I've set my heart there. I'm staring at it, and it gets bigger and bigger as I watch it. Maybe I look, and I say, you know what? This has nothing to do with relationships. Maybe I'm just poor, right? Maybe I'm like, man, I can't pay the bills. Uh, God, are you going to take care of me financially? And I want to look and say, God, is there, is there going to be a way that you're going to come through? Are you going to provide? I'm so poor. I don't have any money to pay anything. And now right, this has become my identity, becomes kind of who I am. Right? Maybe you're in college and you're like, you know what? I'm single. I'm poor. I'm single. I'm poor, right? It like consumes your whole identity of who you are and it it captivates your vision and it's all I can see because whatever I stare at is going to grow. 
becomes my consuming identity of who I am. Maybe I'm going to look and I'm, it's on the flip side and say, you know what? I got all kinds of money, but I got to protect that money. and I want to keep that money and I want to grow that money. And how much money is enough? Just a little bit more. And now rich is now what I long to be and become and it's who I am and it consumes the complete identity of who I am. Right? Maybe you went through something horrific. Uh, maybe the marriage broke down and your dreams have been crushed and maybe there's all kinds of reasons for that and you've been hurt and they did this and you don't know and the injustice of what you went through was unbearable and now it's, it's consumed your vision of the world and this is how I see life. Right? It, it's my lens in which I see all of the rest of who I am. I'm divorced. Maybe I look and say, you know what, I, I, I'm engaged. He popped the question or I popped the question, but we don't have a date yet. Is he going to say yes? I don't know. Is it ever really going to come? Will, will the date, I can't wait till we get there and this is all I see and this is where I am. I'm, in, I'm engaged, right? My dreams are going to come true and will it happen? I can't wait till I get there. Maybe you're married. Maybe it's great or maybe it's not great. Maybe it's not what you thought it would be and you hoped it was like somebody else's. And now my marriage, the problems of my marriage or even the ecstasy of my marriage, whatever it lands on is consumed what I am and who I am and it's what defines me. Paul's going to say, he's going to say, listen, all, all these things, these are just places where I am in life. Right? Where I am is not who I am. Who I'm with is not who I am. Here's who I can be, a Christ follower, right? These can all be taken away. They can all be shaken. At the end of the day, nothing can affect the fact that I'm a follower of Jesus. It cannot be shaken and it cannot be taken. And as I stare at that, as I stare at the fact that Jesus has chosen to forgive me, that he's chosen to love me in spite of my mistakes, in spite of my failures, in spite of my impurity and my sin, in spite of my weaknesses, that he is the one that would never leave me or forsake me. He's the one that will not go. He will always be there. I, I might feel alone, but I'm not. I'm lonely, but I'm not alone, and Christ is with me, and I am a Christ follower, and now I can see my season, my right now, through the grid of my faith. Why? Because that's who I am. I am a follower of Jesus first. Am I single? No, I'm a Christ follower. Am I married? No, I'm a Christ follower. Above all, through all, it's what defines who I am. Let me show you this one passage. Here's, here's what Jesus is going to point to through the Apostle Paul. Verse 20, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, make a note. It says, for no matter how many promises God has made, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. I will never leave you or forsake you. I will forgive you completely. I'll always be there. The Holy Spirit will come and live inside of you. You can have eternity. All of those promises are yes in Christ. Look what he says. And so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us. And he put his spirit in our hearts, guaranteeing what is to come. And by the way, that's heaven. Who owns me? Who defines me? It's not my marital status. It's not my financial status. And by the way, we could put a thousand other examples on here. It's not my age. It's not that I'm young or old or divorced or single or married or rich or poor. I am defined by Jesus. He set his seal of ownership on me. No one can take that. No circumstance, no person, no failure, nothing. It's fixed. It's set. And listen, if you don't yet have that, that's available to you. 
if you're considering following Jesus. Set my heart on the things above. As I was talking to uh, someone the other day, a couple months ago now, and we were having a conversation really about, in essence, about this, and uh, they were telling me their story. As they told me their story, I was so inspired by the approach that they took towards their, their right now, how they dealt with it. And uh, this, my friend Kara, she, she's going to tell us a little bit of her story of how she faced divorce and she faced singleness and kind of her journey along the way. I want to introduce you to Kara. Let's tune into her story here a little bit together. So, um, since I was young, I always looked forward to getting married and having children and having a family of my own. I had a couple failed attempts at that. Um, I was married at 27, and about three years later, that failed. Um, just wondering what went wrong, um, what might be wrong in me. Carried that guilt for a really long time. I carried it into um, another relationship. And again, just in my desire to get married and have my own family. Um, I was seeking the wrong things. So I was 100% focused on that. Um, and God was sort of a side note in my own strength. I could never be successful in that. Um, and when Grace did the series of um, love and relationships. Um, I was reading the book that went along with that and one of the things that kept getting repeated in that book was to take a year and seek God with no distractions and to become the person that you're looking for. And that was something that I had never heard of before. I felt really challenged there and I just felt God prompting me to do that. Again, just kind of struggling through that, sort of digging my heels in and saying, no, God, you know, I know what's best. And <laughs> um, But deep down knowing he's really the one that knows what's best. So in my Bible studies and um, reading God's word, um, I still just felt like God putting it on my heart that he really wanted me to take this year to focus on my relationship with him and focus on learning more about who he is and um, my worth in that relationship. I reluctantly agreed to that. Um, I prayed to him and said, okay, God, even though I don't really want to do this, um, I'm going to trust in who you are. So I prayed to him and committed and God showed up. <laughs> It made me fall more in love with who God is um, and really just increased that desire to know Him more. And then the more that I would learn about who God is and who He is to me, I was able to then share that with others through that whole process. He then began to lay on my heart to be a foster mom, um, to help children in need, and that the gifts that he had given me um, and, and the way that he created me to be were all the things that he needed to take care of his orphans. Where God met me throughout this whole year and seeing how he provided for me in ways that I never would have expected, in ways that really no person I know would have been able to provide for me. Um, you know, a year later, I'm okay and I'm at peace if I don't get married because I'm so sure of who God is and that he will provide every need for me, um, even being a single foster mom. Um, so, Again, and if you were to ask me now, 
where I would be in five years. I would say I would be a foster mom. I would probably have adopted one or two. Do I still desire to be married? Yes. Um, but I don't think that's going to deter my purpose here on earth. Um, I don't think that um, I want someone in my life that will distract me from my relationship with Jesus. So if that means that I'm single the rest of my life, then so be it. Um, never would have thought I'd been saying, would have said that, <laughs> ever. What I love about Kara's story, you know, is that she's taken ownership for where she is. Uh, she's not perfect. She's not looking and saying, oh, I'm going to pretend like I don't want to be married. Right? She's a, I would love to find someone. But she's recognizing, here's where I am, right here, right now. God, you have given me some passions. You have given me some gifts. And I'm going to be the one that makes the decision on what I stare at. If I'm going to stare at my singleness and be consumed by that, or if I'm going to stare at the fact that you love me, God, and you've gifted me and you've called me to spend my life for you. And she's like, I'm going to do it that way. I'm going to let this be the way that I approach life. I love that. I love that. Because here's the thing. My focus is my decision. Right? My focus is my decision. Only I can choose what I stare at. I can't choose it for you. You can't choose it for me. We cannot, in this moment, change our right now. But what we do have the power to decide is what we stare at, what consumes us, and what defines us. I can look and say, all right, I, I'm single, but I'm more than single. I'm a Christ follower. I'm married, but I'm more than married. I'm a Christ follower. I may not be where I want to be financially. It doesn't matter. I'm more than that. I'm more than my bank account, for good or bad, high or low. I am a Christ follower. I'm more than my failure. I'm more than my shame. I choose to follow Jesus. I'm going to choose to see my life through that lens. That's what she did. And so we can do. Because here's the thing. Probably, no matter where we are on the map, most of us wish our lives were a little bit different. That's probably true. Married or single, rich or poor, engaged or divorced, we, we probably wish it was just a little bit more this way or sometimes a lot different. But we all probably want it to, to just have landed or fallen a little bit differently. So we got to make a decision. What am I going to do in the middle of my right now? How am I going to approach this? And here might be some questions I'm asking myself, and you might ask these as well. I got to ask the question, what am I going to stare at? What am I going to stare at? What am I going to, am I going to put in front of my face, and what's going to be my vision for life? Is it a life stage, or is it my actual identity as a follower of Jesus, if you are one? Listen, if you're not yet a follower of Christ, so glad that you're here. I would encourage you to keep exploring that. You can become a Christ follower today. Recognize that Jesus has come to this planet. He laid down his life. He died to pay for my sin and for your sin. And that's how we get an identity is looking to say, Jesus, will you forgive me? I want to follow you. Will you be my definition and my direction? What am I going to stare at? What's going to be my lens that I look at life through? Another question I might ask is this. What, what has God put in you? What, what passions for God? What gifts has he put in you? Do you know those yet? Do you know we have a class that helps you find all that stuff? It's the shape class. Have you moved towards seeing those gifts activated and mobilized? Have you found 
what God has put you on the planet to do yet? Is it possible that God wants you to discover that right now, in this season? You say, but it's, it's, it's so imperfect. I, exactly. <laughs> right here, right now, just like Kara did. Last question I might ask you this is, can you embrace that? Can you embrace where you are today? You may not love it. It may be horribly painful. God may change it in the months and years to come, but can you say, all right, God, this is where I am. This is my lot, and I'm going to accept it, and I want to meet you here, right here, right now, and I want to learn how to do this just like Kara did. I want to surrender my season. I want to say, Lord, have your way in me. Would you make me more like you? Would you use my life? Can we do that? Love for us to process that decision. Have the band come out. I want to pray for us. As we sing and as we worship, would you think about kind of giving over your season to God, asking Him to use it, change it from the inside out right now. Let me pray for us. Father, we, we want to stop right now and, and recognize your love for us. God, thank you that you've chosen to forgive all of our sin, that that's available to us, that we can become your children, your sons and daughters, no longer a failure or no longer alone. God, we're never alone with you. You said you would never leave us or forsake us. You'd never fail us. God, thank you that you put purpose in us, that you include us in your plan and your work, and you can make us useful and make us a blessing to other people, whatever that purpose is. And God, we, we choose to all turn over our season to you, invite you into it. God, would you give us the courage not to stare at whatever whatever thing we're in the middle of, but to look up to you and to allow your glory and your power and your fame and your love to grow in our hearts, in our minds, and in our vision for this life. We surrender, Lord. Meet us here even now.